Good afternoon, evening, or morning, everyone. A very warm welcome to our webinar on the future of non-invasive urolithiasis treatment. I'm with you from Donia MedTech, and together with Christian Burren, we will be your hosts for today. Having my eyes on medical technologies for over 15 years now, it has been rather surprising that the progression of surgeries, usually moving from highly invasive to minimally invasive and then to non-invasive, is somewhat reversed uh, in the case of urolithiasis treatment, where we have in recent years in some countries seen physicians moving away from the non-invasive option. Particularly with COVID-19, uh, it has brought on really difficult demands to minimize cross-infection, have patients out of hospitals and conserve precious hospital resources, physicians we've spoken to are starting to revisit and re-acknowledge the importance and unique value of extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy holes as one of the only available non-invasive approaches to urolithiasis treatment. Today's webinar is thus a very timely one brought together by ULIS, and we are delighted to have with us an excellent panel to share their experience, expertise, and insights on this important topic. Before we start, just a couple of housekeeping points. Um, whenever we have a slide showing, the speaker appears in the pop box where you will see me and perhaps some other speakers. Um, this box, if it blocks your view of the slides, you can move it around like a normal window. Just click on the top bar and drag it. Uh, you can also resize it uh, by dragging out the corners. The most important part is to ask questions, which we welcome. Uh, please click on the Q&A button on the bar that should appear if you move your mouse around. Okay. Uh, we welcome your questions throughout the session, and I'll be collating these questions, and we will do our best to have the panelists answer as many of them as possible at the end of the talks. The chat box is deactivated, so please use the Q&A channel to reach us. Without further ado, I'll hand the time over to Christian, who's going to introduce our fantastic panel. Christian, over to you. Thanks, Buisu. So also a very warm welcome from my side. Uh, Christian Behrens is my name, and I now have the honor to introduce uh, our panel. And starting with our moderator, here we have Professor Kemal Sarika. Um, he's chief of department of urology um, in Istanbul, in Turkey. But also Professor Sarika is the chairman of EAU section of Eurolithiasis and also the co-chairman of um, IAU, which is the International Alliance of Eurolithiasis. Um, besides being also a member of the editorial board of various international urology journals, Professor Sarika himself has over 200 international publications and lots of uh, chapters written also in various books. So we have lots of knowledge here. Then we are coming to our um, Dr. Alish Petrik from Czech Republic. Um, Dr. Petrik is vice head of Department of Urology in Region Hospital in Budweis in Czech Republic. But also Dr. Petrik is the assistant professor in the Department in, uh, of Urology in First Medical Faculty of Charles University in Prague. And also he is a member of the guideline panel of Urolith at EAU and also he has lots of scientific articles, over 60 articles, um, seven books and chapters that he is also writing. Um, also here we have very good knowledge. Then coming to Dr. Mehmet Ilker Gökçe. Dr. Gökçe is um, Associate Professor of Urology at Ankara University, also in Turkey. And Dr. Gökçe has published over 100 articles in the field of urology. And he is also associate board member of European Association of Urology section of Eurolithiasis. And also he is member of International Alliance of Eurolithiasis in several working groups over here. So also welcome Dr. Gökçe. And last but not least, we have Dr. Alberto Budia Alba. Dr. Budia is Head of Faculty at Lithotripsy and Endourological Unit at La Fe University and Polytechnic Hospital in Valencia. And also Dr. Budia is Associate Professor of Valencia University and member of several associations like Spanish Urological Association, the EAU, the Endourology Society. And here 
he has, um, he's also author of over 90 scientific publications in journals, books, and several apps of urology, and also reviewer in several international journals. So as you have heard, we have lots of knowledge here in our panel. And with those words, I hand over to our moderator, Kemal Sarika. Welcome, Kemal. Thank you, Christine. Thanks a lot. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. A warm welcome from Istanbul and also a warm welcome on the name of Yulis Board. We are pleased to have you among us during this webinar this evening. And we have three distinguished friends from different departments from the world and they are very well experienced in the non-invasive management of stones, particularly on shock value to dripsy. I'm also thankful to Dornier company for giving us the chance of organizing this webinar in order to tell something about the latest developments in the technology or concepts in non-invasive treatment of urolithiasis. Non-invasive treatment of urolithiasis means being really non-invasive, doing nothing as an intervention to the uh, patients, no anesthesia, and no impact on the quality of life of the cases. And shockwave epilepsy today is the only way of treating the stones in a really, truly non-invasive manner. We are passing through a pandemic era. Over the last four months, we learned something from our departments, from our countries, and that have something really changed in our life, in our practice. We couldn't have our department active, we couldn't see our patients, and we couldn't treat our stone patients in the way that we routinely treated them. And we looked for some solutions in order to treat at least the emergency cases to get rid of the stone and the problems associated with these stones. And during this era, we learned that shock related as is the really non-invasive way of treating the cases, might be the best treated treatment modality to treat stone patients in the pandemic era. No anesthesia, no, let's say, distress to the quality of life of the cases and distance to the patient, to the other collect, uh, cooperating people in the department, and we may treat the patients with stones, I mean, the suitable cases, appropriate cases, based on the guidelines, let's say indications, we began to treat the cases with shock literacy. In other words, we reinvented or reconsidered the value of shock literacy as a valuable, effective, safe, and non-invasive way of treating stones. Today, we will focus on the different aspects of shock validity with the latest information, latest developments in this field of uh, stone treatment. We will this, uh, focus on the feature of non-invasive stone treatment, factors affecting our choices during shock validity tripsy, tips and tricks how to improve the results of shock validity and also we will focus on the guidelines based information which patient, which stone, and why. So now let's begin to our webinar in order to get the latest information developments on shock literacy. And we will begin first with Professor Gökçe, and he will be talking about the feature of non-invasive treatment. What will we see? What will we change? Professor Gökçe, please, we are listening to you now. Thank you, Professor Sergio, for this kind uh, introduction. And I will also like to thank the EULIS and the Dornier webinar team for this uh, kind invitation and just preparing this wonderful webinar. And my first talk will be to talk about the future of the non-invasive storm management, especially while we are in the era of this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, actually, in order to talk about the future, first of all, we should know what's going on uh, in the present situation and what has happened in the past. 
And uh, first of all, we should outline what, we, uh, what are our attitudes in order to perform the uh, management of urinary stone disease. And this study was published in 2015. Uh, in this study, it outlines the North American attitude for management of renal stones. And we can clearly see that uh, from 2003 to 2012, there is a 40% increase in the utilization of ureter rhinoscopy. Uh, while the percutaneous nephrotomy was relatively stable, but the use of shockwave to trip C decreased by 33% in this time period. And another uh, result from this study was when we compared the endourologist and the non endourologist it seems interesting that shockwave to trip C is more commonly applied by the non endourologist So any uh, urologist uh, trained as an endourology specialist, they tend to operate more. This means that the more we are trained, the more we like to operate. And this is another study published uh, in 2017 and shows us a more global perspective uh, and in a longer time period, but the results are quite similar. The results are quite parallel to the previous one. The share of urethroscopy increased by 17%. Again, percutaneous nephrotomy is stable, but the use of the share of shockwave leukotripsy among the total treatments for stones decreased by 14.5%. And later on, we also see some uh, interesting talks and interesting topics in our national and international congresses as well. And these are usually against use of shockwave to trip C. For example, this one was from the AUA 2015 meeting that the title is quite interesting, Extra extracorporeal shockwave to trip C is falling out of paper. And one year later, there is an opposing views paper in the Journal of Urology, and the title was now more provocative. The arrow of shockwave to trip C is over, and it was advocated by two very well-known European endourologists. And in, in the EAU 2018 meeting, the title was again interesting, the final knockout of shockwave to trip C by retrograde intraenal surgery. And it's obvious that although it's a 40 years old treatment with its true non-invasive nature, we don't need anesthesia, we don't need hospitalization, the complication rates are low, success rates are satisfactory, and the cost is low compared to endurology, but still the popularity of shockwave to trip C is decreasing. And uh, the, one of the re main reasons underlying is the technological advancements in the endurological procedures. Now we have really very fancy tools. We like to operate more. And for example, the, uh, we have now digital instruments. They have better views. We have high power lasers. The laser technology is evolving. Uh, we have suction sheets, dedicated mini pianal instruments, and also the surgical technique is improving. Like we can combine now the flexible ureteroscopy and percutaneous surgery. And so all of these actually contribute to the minimal invasiveness of the management of urinary stones and decreasing the complications and increasing success rates. But for the future, we should still keep in mind that shockwave is the only non-invasive treatment option. So how about the effects of COVID-19? We are really in the era of an, an important health problem, a global problem. And uh, in order to outline its effects on uh, endourology, we actually, as the eu list Collaborative Research Working Group, ECOR, published two uh, articles in the last three months. And the first one was a web-based study. Uh, a questionnaire was distributed to the endourologists among all Europe, and we just took their outcomes. And it was uh, interesting that the COVID-19 pandemic very significantly changed the, changed the practice patterns of endourologists in uh, Europe. And given the risk of novel viral pandemics in the future, we should be aware of possible alterations in our surgical options so that in the future, a non-surgical but effective treatment option would be uh, valuable uh, for the future. And the second study was relying on real patient data. Uh, we had data from uh, 11 different centers, including Italy, China, Turkey, Bulgaria, and Greece. And we have nearly data of uh, 500 patients, and all the data was evaluated for stone-related procedures regarding the preoperative evaluation, type of anesthesia, and the type of the stone-related interventions. And the results were quite interesting that after three weeks of pandemic in the uh, current uh, country, uh, there is significant alteration in the used anesthesia method and alteration in the store related procedure. And also we tend to uh, perform more preoperative additional testing in after this duration as well. And now the situation is still going on. And when we 
ask the question, why did this pandemic very significantly affected our rhodiasis practice patterns? Uh, first of all, uh, mo most of our surgeries are elective surgeries and we had to postpone them. And now currently we have, uh, during the normalization period, longer waiting lists for the surgeries. Another one is the preoperative anesthesia evaluation is another issue. We still do not know what is ideal, how to evaluate these patients. Uh, despite use of spinal anesthesia more together with the general anesthesia, there is still a risk of vital transmission to the team in the operating room, especially anesthesiologists. And also the COVID-19 patients still occupy important number of beds, for example, in my hospital, and also they consume the hospital resources as well. And another very important point is we have some problems with the OR cleaning process the air conditioning, and also the sterilization of the surgical instruments as well. And these are all problems related to COVID-19 pandemic. But not only the physicians, but also the patient's perspectives are also changed during this pandemic. Uh, patients still want to get rid of the air stone as soon as possible, but uh, compared to the pre-COVID uh, era, Patients do not want uh, operation. They do not want to undergo anesthesia. They don't want to get hospitalized. And also they don't want compl complications and related further hospitalization. So shock wave may be a good way to get rid of the stone wa stones while, getting, uh, while we can exclude these unwanted uh, occasions. So what is waiting us in the future? Related to the endurological procedures, we are sure that the endoscopes will get better. We will get, have better weaves and we will have smaller instruments. Laser technology is evolving. They will be more powerful, more efficient, and the surgical techniques will evolve as well. And with all of these, we expect the increased torture rates and decreased complication rates and morbidity. However, for just a minute, I want you to think out of the box a little bit. Just think that this uh, young gentleman, Christine Chaussey, didn't he went shockwave to Tripsy 40 years ago, and he just jumps into a time machine, comes to our day today, and tells us that I have a new technology for management of urinary stones. And with this technology, you can treat your patients at an outpatient, outpatient procedure. There is no risk of anesthesia-related transmission. There is no risk of body fluid-related transmission. You don't need to postpone it. You can, uh, as an elective surgery, you can do it as an outpatient procedure, and you don't need any post-operative care, and you can have excellent snowfield rates with low complications if you properly select your patient and do your operation appropriately and ask the question, would you like to try this new treatment, new technology? And I'm sure that most of us will answer this question as yes. And so for the future, I believe that endourological treatment options will evolve very well, but shockwave lithotripsy will also have a place in the, our daily routine treatment options uh, for treatment of the urinary stone disease. Thank you. Thank you so much, Etkan. Thanks a lot for this really excellent presentation. You summarized the actual, current, and also future position of shock relativity in an excellent manner. And you stated that shock relativity is not dying, is not dead, it is still active and it has a certain role in the non-invasive management of stones. If we say it's died, it's dead, or it's dying, then guidelines and the information in the guidelines need to be also dying or uh, abolishing. That's not accepted, and we know that there are certain indications, guideline-based indications, unless our dear friend will talk about it, are in the guidelines, and we need chocolate literacy in certain patients with good indications. Thanks a lot. Now we will have a poll question in between. And let's have the question and it's, it's uh, replies to the question, please. So the question is, what, what is the most common method used by your facility for your as a cases in the past four months, PCNL, urodroscopy, shock relativity, and watchful waiting or medical explosive therapy. That means during the era of pandemic.
soon we will get the replies to the question and we will discuss about the replies coming from the participants. So, we have the replies coming from the participants. We are thankful to them. And here we see, when we evaluate data, participants, they were prone to apply shock value therapy, watchful waiting, or medical explosive therapy in advance, or more than the other options when we compare with PCNL and ureteroscopy. They were also applied, but to a lesser extent. So, you can. How do you interpret these findings? Around 30% of the orders use shock value therapy and 32% watchful waiting and medical explosive therapy for the treatment of stones. How do you comment? Yeah. Actually, uh, these results are that most of the time we expect uh, such outcomes. Uh, of course, we still need to do some URS and percutaneous surgery for the management of the cases, despite in the era of COVID pandemic, if you take the uh, related preventive measures. Uh, and I guess uh, we now apply much more virtual waiting and medical explosive therapy uh, during the era of COVID pandemic. And related to this second question, uh, around one fourth of the participants do not have access to shockwave to tripsy. Uh, it's also uh, something that we expect, but 75% actually have an access. It's good. And uh, uh, 25, 21 percent of the participants actually answered that uh, there is uh, they they try to do shockwave to therapy more than before, and it's actually quite good, I guess. So thank you so much for these nice comments. That means the importance or the real dessert place of shockwave to therapy has been reconsidered again during pandemic, and our friends, it seems that they applied shock relative as a non-invasive alternative during this risky, problematic pandemic era. Thank you, Ilker, for the nice presentation and also for the nice comments to the poll questions. Thanks a lot. So let's move to the other presentation. And I will make the presentation. It will be about the changes in the technology in shock value to trip C. May I have my slide, please? So, regarding the application of shock value to trip C over the years back, around 40 years, we know that something has changed regarding the technology that we use. In late uh, beginning of 80s, we began with the HM3, the gold standard system used for the treatment of stones as shock value to trip C with electrohydraulic ellipsoid, and today we have different shockwave uh, units changed in their shape and also in the production and delivery of high energy shockwaves in order to treat the uh, stones in the kidney and also in the ureter. We know that outcome of the shockwave relativity is dependent on some certain factors. First, energy production is very, very, very important. We will produce the energy to treat the or disintegrate the stones. Delivery to the produced energy to the, directly to the stone without losing its, let's say, uh, uh, power will be another factor for us to consider. Improving the imaging to see the stone or stones clearly, to see them and to treat them, that means we should identify and see them very well in order to have success in the treatment and also training of the physicians to improve the outcomes of shock literacy in this particular method will be also very important, particularly for the young urologists to teach them. May I have the same sec? Yes. Here we see the energy production. 
We urologists, we want to have produced energy in a controlled manner. It, it should be optimum, persistent, and reproducible. What does that mean? That means the energy produced should be consistent in all, all during the whole treatment. It shouldn't be changed. At every shock wave, we need to have the same energy level with the same characteristics. It should be controlled, it should be optimum, and most importantly, it should be persistent. But here you see, if we use electrohydraulic shock wave source being used in the HM3 in the beginning, it's not persistent. It may change. That means at every shock wave, we may have different level of energy delivered to the stone, and it will affect the outcome also of the procedure, the disintegration of the stones. However, here you see from the diagram with flat electromagnetic shock wave source, it is possible to have a controlled and persistent energy produced with stable, consistent pressure emission throughout the treatment itself, throughout the session. Next slide, please. And we know that in the beginning, we had dry systems, uh, water bath systems. Patient, they were all immersed into, into the bath and uh, in the water, they have been treated. There was no dry uh, system in the technologies. And here you see, patient was immersed in the DGS water bath and efficient energy transfer as no additional medium between the shockwave energy and source and the patient was present. That's why HM3 was the most powerful system that we uh, saw up to now. They were so powerful and so efficient. But today we have dry literature systems. What does it mean, dry technology? We have uh, water in the system and between the patient and this dry literature systems, we need to some coupling agent in order to uh, deliver the shockwave energy, shockwave, uh, not to not losing its, let's say, power from the uh, source till the stone inside the body. In a, the other slide, please. But using a coupling system in the dry systems, it requires some let's say, tips and tricks to overcome. Air bubbles is the most important problem that may be present over the uh, shockwave head that will be interfere with the uh, delivery of the high energy shockwaves. That means if we have air bubbles, not, here you will see, just a moment, yeah, on the therapy head, then it will certainly will interfere with the energy delivery just from the energy source till the uh, stone in the body itself and these, these air bubbles will be a certain problem or handicap for us in order to deliver the uh, high energy shock waves without losing their power from the source till the stone in the body. May I have this slide, second slide, the other slide please? Here you see if we have a special system integrated in the shockwave head that help us to monitor the presence and degree of uh, air bubbles in the therapy head, it will be really excellent for us in order to realize the presence of them and to remove them constantly during the treatment itself in order not to have them and not to let them to, let's say, decrease the efficiency of our high energy shock waves produced that should go into the body and disintegrate the stone. For that reason, if the new system that you are working with have this special system integrated, opti coupled system, uh, the, the data tree system from Dorena, I am using it, it's a really distinct opportunity for you. You may surveillance, a surveillance camera inside the shockwave head will help you to monitor the presence of air bubbles and when needed to uh, remove them from the therapy head, have a clean therapy head without no bubble, air bubble on site, and they will not be interfering the effect of high energy shock waves. So let's have the other slide, please. These are the data 
summarizing the effect of air bubbles if we have the outcomes of the procedure. Surveillance with camera coupling and removing the air bubbles by monitoring them throughout the session will help us a lot. And here you see the overall stone free rates will be higher, retreatment rates and also need for ancillary procedures will be less if we have the opportunity to see, to monitor the presence of air bubbles during the procedure. But blind coupling, here you see, will certainly give you problems and the outcomes of the procedure will come down. That's the reality we should know. And if you have this chance, you will have the chance to increase your stone free rates. On the other hand also, if your uh, literature system have the chance to give you, to change the position of therapy, that means we know the stones inside the kidney or in the ureter should be aligned through the path of the high energy shock wave just from the beginning as they produce and deliver. For that reason, we need to have some tricks to change the therapy head to find another, let's say, angle to see the stone well and to deliver the high energy shock waves in order to have the shock waves going to the stone in a direct manner aligned with the production of the system, uh, I mean, the health therapy head. If we have this system, if we use the Balta window application of therapy head, here you see, in the end, we will have around 20% less shock wave required for treatment, around 26% reduction in the analgesic dose during the treatment, uh, effectiveness of the uh, powdering of the kidney stones will be higher than anticipated, 37% of the stone will be more powering less than three millimeters. That is the anticipated size in the end. And also 53% more clearance rates will be anticipated. So in summary, if we have the new system with changing therapy head, that will allow us to find the right direction or window to have our shock waves going to the body, directly to the stone, to disintegrate it and have high stone free rates. The other slide, please. The other vital uh, issue during the shock wave literacy is the localization, precise localization and targeting of the stone. If we localize the stone well, if we see the stone well, then we will have the focus target that to deliver our shock waves directly into the uh, stone itself. And Surveillance of the treatment during the session will be really excellent if we have good imaging and also identification of the fragmentation during the uh, session, also in the end of the session. If we have any idea about the fragmentation rate, we will be happy to see the result and also to tell something to the case treated in the end of the session. May I have the second the other slide, please? To localize the stone, we have two different options. Over the years back, we mainly used X-ray imaging systems and also later on, we integrated sonography, depending on the experience of the operators to use them either in single way or in, uh, together in the same system. If we use them together, that means if your new literature system have them together for use, you will have some advantages and disadvantages of these two opportunities or the, the system. Related to the X-ray, we know that the uh, X -ray radiation exposure is the most important parameter that should be kept in mind. That means we, may, we cannot use X-ray during the whole session in order to monitor the stone, what's going on, how is it being disintegrated, what can change that will be really dangerous both for the patient and also operator. We need to use X-ray in an interrupted manner to check the system, the, the procedure itself. But if you have ultrasound integrated in the system, you can use ultrasound throughout the whole procedure. That means 100% monitoring is possible during shock wave You will realize what's going on. Is the stone is being disintegrated? what's being changed in the stone itself. And no radiation exposure is the main, let's say, advantage of using the ultrasound. 
But on the other hand, if you, you use X-ray, it's a uh, learning curve is really short and easy learning is possible. But on the other hand, for ultrasonography, young generation, it's a must for them. I may tell it is a, a little bit steep learning, but the learning curve may be a little bit longer, but they need to le learn it. They need to use it, not only for shock literacy, but also for PCNL, also for the patients in the outpatient department also to get an idea about the kidney and the stones themselves. The best thing is to have them together and use sonography in the majority of the time during the treatment. Yeah, the slide, please. So, if, if we have an enhanced system, imaging system integrated in the uh, literature to itself, like the Optivision system in Dorney Delta 3, I have it and I'm, I'm, I'm really used, I'm very satisfied with it. What we'll have in the end, we will have the reduction in the radiation rates for the patients and for the users. Stones, irrespective of chemical composition, can be targeted by using ultrasound. That's the major advantage of sonography. Live monitoring and tracking of the stones during shock radiography will reduce the number of high energy shock required. And also, if you have the chance to use the color doppler system, also it will have some other advantages with twinning effect, artifact, to identify the stone, to localize it very well, and to treat, to see the changes during the treatment. So, the other slide, please. So, good imaging means you will have uh, the chance to identify, to localize the stone in all conditions. We may identify, see the, let's say, uh, opaque stones very well, larger stone very well, but there are some problems that may, we may face during the treatment. In obese cases, stones with faint lucent, non-opaque stones or slightly opaque stones, the patient could have some bowel gas hiding the stones behind it, and also smaller stones in the calluses could not be so easy to localize. And if you have these enhanced imaging systems integrated in the therapy head, then you will have really very well images, clear-cut images to check the stone in the beginning, during the treatment, and also in the end of the procedure. This will uh, let us to check the end of uh, success rate of the treatment, disintegration rate of the stone, and with this op opportunity, we may have the chance to tell the patient himself or herself, was the stone disintegrated, not at all, or how many pieces, how many fragments, their sizes, we may have something, and patient, they will have some idea about the uh, result of the procedure just in the end of the session. Here is a slide, please. So here you see Optivision system integrated with Dornier Delta 3 system, and you may have blurred the uh, image of the stone, not a good image quality, but if you have blow you these images, a good quality, I, I call it just like city images, you will have all details of the stone, its size, its density, and its location, and this will give you the opportunity to monitor the stone throughout the session and in the end to check it, the uh, results of efficiency of high energy shock waves and the changes in the stones themselves. Thank you so much for, the, for your nice attention, kind attention. So we will have another poll question now and then we will see how the participants will join us. The question is, please select if you agree with the following. I believe coupling is one of the most important aspects to ensure good shock related treatment. I would like to learn more about latest technology to reduce radiation and improve imaging during shock related therapy. If possible, I would like to see features that allow us to personalize shock related therapy treatment to patient, ability to record, record treatment parameter data, used during a treatment can support post-treatment outcome evaluation and offer insights to improve future treatments. Ultrasound should be used instead of X-ray in the future. Let's wait for the choices coming from the participants.
So we have the results now. When we evaluate the, let's say, choices of the participants, we see that majority of the participants stated that they believe coupling is one of the most important aspects to ensure good shock palliative treatment. And also, they want to learn about the latest technology to reduce and improving imaging during shock palliative And to some extent, they want to record the treatment parameters to have an idea about, the, let's say, application of high energy shock waves. So, more or less, they also stated the importance of other factors also. As I stated during my presentation, coupling is, a good coupling is a must during the shock military application. If we want to use high energy shock waves with their high energy levels, we should not have any air bubble on the shock therapy head that will interfere with their really power. And we go to the body, to the stone themselves. And also use of uh, sonography during the treatment is very important because you will have the chance to monitor the, treat, the whole treatment, the changes in the stone itself. During the whole treatment, you will have an idea. Sometimes you may stop the procedure if you have, get the chance to see that stone really is very well disintegrated. This will limit the risk of radiation exposure. So let's go further with the webinar. And the other topic is also another topic relevant with this poll question. And my dear friend, my dear brother from Valencia, Professor Alberto, will talk about the tips and tricks to increase the success rates of high energy, use of high energy shock waves and shock radiotherapy. What shall we do? What, what parameters shall be considered in order to increase the chance of high energy shock wave application? Alberto, please. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much to Dr. Sarika and Dornier for your kind invitation to take part in this meeting. Can you show my slides, please? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, next slides, please. As you know, nowadays we are living important changes in the way of treating urinary stones. Next slide. Due to the important technological, technological advances in endourology. Next slide. So, endoscopy it seems because endoscopy we are uh, adoptive uh, technological advances in endoscopy. It seems that the corporeal lithotripsy is uh, an ancient technique. Endoscopy because the first time that it was used, endoscopy was in the 80s. So, next slide. And these factors uh, have left to a loss of interest in, in the part in, in the majority endoscopy of the urologists, mainly the younger ones in favor in the extracorporeal lithotripsy in favor of endurological techniques so next slide the, the main question in my opinion is is that is really necessary to increase or to optimize the success rate of extracorporeal lithotripsy and really i think so i think that is necessary because if we evaluate the stone free rate of retrograde internal surgery in the literature, in the scientific literature, next slide, we can see that uh, the stone free rate published is between uh, 71 to 92%. It's to say, and to ask, there is a narrow, a narrow or short variability in the results. However, in extracorporeal lithotripsy, the stone free rate between different departments, different authors, is, uh, has a wide variability, has an important wide variability from 33% to 92%. And in my opinion, and to ask, I think that if we consider uh, the effectiveness of all of little filter equally, then and to ask, we think that we can increase this uh, stone free rate because uh, the problem is not the lethal filter. The problem may be 
uh, or can be, is the process of extracorporeal, is the way of performing extracorporeal lithopathy. So, next slide. So, and those que to know some tips and tricks, and those que can help to improve success, and those que rate. The first aspect, and those que before performing a uh, sacroporeal lithotripsy, is to know how works our lithotripsy, and to know as well the localization systems, and those the force sonography and x ray in our lithotripsy. Another point, and those important to know, is the penetration depth of our lithotripsy in order to avoid treating patients with a uh, distance between the skin and the stone longer than the penetration depth or focal distance of our lithotripsia. And it's important as well, next slide, to know the focal zone size, in terms of, because this focal zone size is determining the density of energy that we are going to apply. So if we are going to treat patients with a high risk, we should use a low energy, a low density of energy, depending on the focal zone and size. Next, next slide. So using these tips and those can tricks in, in the sacrocular lithotripsy, we are going to do the best practice. And next slide, for doing the best, for doing the best practice, the most important is to uh, make a, a proper selection of the patient. We should avoid to treat with estacopolisotripsy resistant stones that we, that we can estimate by, t by CT with the Hansfield units. And of course, in terms that we can avoid in terms that to treat patients with a long distance between the skin and the stones. And of course, we can avoid and treating patients with uh, anatomic anomalities in which in terms that it's difficult to pass uh, the stones uh, from the renal or from the kidney and from the ureter. So in these patients, we should avoid uh, to treat patients with extracorporeal lithotripsy. But there are some technical aspects uh, to know for doing the best practice in extracorporeal lithotripsy. So in our experience, in our experience, the most in one of the most important aspects is to try to reduce the variability between different operators in our department. Is to say, if we reduce the clinical variability between operators, it's sure that we are going to increase the uh, success rate with the corporeal. So it's important that we can standardize the process for all the operators in our departments. Next slide. Another an, an important aspect is the information to our patients. In clinical sessions that we did with, uh, with patients, that have been treated with extracorporeal lithotripsy in our department, they told us that the quality of the information that they receive the first time that visit our unit is very important in terms of for them, because in terms of we can reduce with a quality information the anxiety of the patient the first time, and they feel safer and more, and more comfortable when we arrive to our unit for the first session of extracorporeal lithotripsy. The second aspect is that, next slide please, is that in, my, in our opinion, urologists, urologists should be, uh, should, be uh, or, uh, should perform the extracorporeal lithotripsy. Because when in my department, we started, urologists started and to treat the patients or to use the extracorporeal, the stone free rate increased a lot. And also when it was compared with the technician or with the nursery, that perform a uh, sacrocular lithotripsy many years ago in our department. It's important the experience of the operator, and in our experience, is as well is an important factor to reduce the number of operators in our lithotripsy. Because if you have a low number of operators, your uh, success rate is increasing as well. Next slide. In the first, in the first, in the in the phase of patient preparation, it's recommended to stop antiplatelet drugs and those get seven or 10 days before the treatment. And if the patient is taking anticoagulants and those get we uh, should use a bitchin therapy for avoid uh, bleeding complications. Next slide. It's important as well to, uh, to make a, a good control of the blood pressure because before and during the treatment, because in our experience, the main cause of bleeding complications, mainly perioneal hematoma, is and does get a bad control of blood pressure during the session. Next slide. 
The next step is the position in terms of the patient. Is uh, where is the position? The position of the patient really depends on the uh, localization in terms of the stone. If the stone is on the blue areas, in these cases, in terms of we can treat our patients in a supine position and delivering the soil wave from the back. In these cases, uh, we have to make sure that a uh, skeleton structure no interference in the and so wave and those path. If the stone is on the red blue and the, in the in the red and those area, next slide, in the red areas, in these cases and those we have to use a transdominal path. In these cases and those we can use a overhead and those overhead therapy, over table uh, therapy head position in, like in the figure, or we can put the patient in, in the uh, prone position. The main problem with this entoscopy path is the inter is the interference of the gas intestinal because if we have if we have gas intestinal, the energy can extinguish and we can increase the damage in terms of the intestinal walls in the in the intestinal in the in the intestinal wall. In the cases in Tosca that we have in uh, last please previous slide next. If we have an endoscopy stone in the angle between the spine and pelvic brain or in the sacroiliac joint, sometimes in those cases we have to modify the position of the patient, or sometimes in those cases we have to inclinate in the endoscopy the head therapy to reach endoscopy better. It's, there are, those, there, uh, there are uh, difficult and those place and those to treat and those Next slide. Next, please. One important aspect is uh, one important aspect is uh, the coping. And those if we want to, to have a high uh, success rate and those with the sacroporeal, uh, we and those need that the soul wave and those can uh, pass into the body and those with a loss minimal uh, loss of energy. So and those there is a gap between the the soul wave and those source and the body that has to be bridged. Uh, so, and those we need, and those to put uh, a medium uh, of our transmission, and those medium in large quantities, and and those spread it over, uh, decreasing the presence of high levels. Because and those we know, as commented before, Doctor uh, Sarika, if we have uh, twenty percent of high levels on the therapy head and surface, we can reduce the effectiveness of extracorporeal eutripsy in more than twenty percent. Of and those of and those the patients. Next slide. Next slide. The treatment should be started with a series of soap wave at low energy level, about 100, and follow it by a pulse on those of a few minutes in order to get a favorable vasoconstriction. Evidence and those has shown as well that with a longer and low energy power so wave and the vasoconstriction is and those that can be reached in the same way. So with these maneuvers and those that we can reduce the bleeding complications when we started the treatment in our patients. Next slide. The ramping technique is recommended and those can have several advantages. It's easier for the waking patient to adapt to the treatment. The second advantage is ramping facilitates a stop at which level uh, at which level stone disintegration starts, and, and so we can avoid over treat the patient in terms of energy. And, and those can finally, ramping technique results in a better disintegration than when the power level constantly is used during the treatment because the low energy generates smaller fragments than high and those levels. Next slide. The slow frequency is recommended and those because it has increased the disintegration and has reduced the damage and those of the tissues, especially in the kidney. So and those low frequency is recommended in high risk patients, high patients with hypertension, cardiovascular disease, diabetes in itis, reduced range function, and of course and those the children. Next slide. Heat rate of extracorporeal lithotripsy and those can and those decrease when the stone is in the kidney or is in the upper, in the proximal ureter due to the respiratory movements of the patient. 
So the basic rule is in terms of to place the focus or to place the stone in the focus in the expiatory phase. Because in these cases, in terms of we can increase the high rate in, in, terms of in this location, on in, in this stone's location. And so in terms of we can control with the X-ray pulse technique and in terms of we recommend to use collimators to reduce the radiation exposure of the patients. Next slide, please. It's not clear the number of uh, so waves recommended uh, in, in the literature is not well defined. And so the recommendation is the upper limit is 2,000 and 4,000 so waves per session. But in those cases, this number in those cases, should reduce in patients with high risk or children. Next slide. However, in those cases, we have a different experience because in those cases, we have in those cases, studied a large expanded number of soul waves in those cases, with a high frequency and we demonstrated and published that to use a high frequency, a high number of soul waves increase the effectiveness when we compare with a high frequency standard treatment with a same a safety profile in this in those study. So, in those case, next slide, in those case, nowadays, in those case, we are carrying out a clinical trial in which we are comparing uh, extended in those case, treatment in number of ways with a high frequency against a uh, standard treatment with a low frequency. And in our initial results, we have no uh, fine difference in, in the outcomes in the stone free rates with the same uh, safety in terms of profile, but it's the only the initial results and we have to extend a lot in terms of this study to obtain a definitive conclusions. Next slide. It's important as well to a uh, proper monitoring of the patient and the position of the patient if the patient in terms of has moved or the stone uh, exit in terms of from the focus. It's important and don't get to take into account that if we increase the floor skip time, the floor skip time, we are going to increase as well the success rate. So if we're monitoring exhaustively the patient, perhaps we are going to increase as well the success rate of endoscopy um, treatment. Next. It's important and don't get to avoid the movements and awaken patients and don't get to use a sufficient pain relief. So we combine morphine and miraculan and those get to try to control and those get the pain that is one of the most important aspects that the patient told us and those get they wanted to avoid the spikes and those get pain so they asked for us uh, a continuous analgesia during the treatment next slide in our experience it's important as well to reduce the anxiety of the patient during the extracorporeal isotripsy we apply music and those get we uh, our patients can choose uh, five different types and those of music in five folder difference and we have demonstrated and published as well that the use of music can reduce the anxiety of the patient increase the satisfaction and increase as well the pain relief in our in a bit and just study that in those with the group and those three years and those ago next slide and finally in those case important and those get to have and those get to take into account the follow-up because we can use as well non-invasive and those get therapy to facilitate the uh, the passage of the stone we can use different drugs and those get alpha blockers uh, calcium channel antagonist blocking actions and we have non-invasive and those get techniques like percussion and inversion therapy to treat uh, residual fragments in the uh, lower kidney uh, in the lower pole of the kidney next so so, uh, in my opinion, I think that if we apply different tips and tricks that I have comment, we can increase as well the uh, success rate of uh, stacropoidal autopsy. But in terms of it's important in terms of to take into account that in terms of we can increase as well, uh, we can increase as well the results that really matter to the patients. Next slide. And in our experience, and those that we have demonstrated that the quality of life and those that, that extracorporeal give our patient is similar to endurological surgery, but extracorporeal isotripsy is a cheaper and those technique. So for renal and ureteral stones, in our experience, extracorporeal lithotripsy is more efficient in terms of cost utility analysis. And therefore, uh, extracorporeal, next slide, Uh, uh, extracorporeal lithotripsy takes a total time of work, a less total time of work in days when applied, when we compare with retroscope 
and we reduce as well the total and direct cost for society when it's compared with endurological uh, techniques. Next slide. So, in Venosca, we can conclude that we can really maximize the success rate and we can do it uh, doing the best practice. And the best practice is a, a proper selection of the patients to be treated with a sacrocorial lithotripsy and, and to apply, next slide, to apply uh, different tips and tricks. Perfect coupling, initial low energy, ramping technique, low frequency, exhaustive control, and monitoring patient, and finally, pain relief. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Alberto, again, for this excellent presentation, stating the tips and tricks to increase our success rates during shock relativity. If you ask me to summarize your presentation, uh, one or two sentences, points, I may say that do it yourself, by yourself. Have the enough experience on the system technique and know the relevant, necessary tips and tricks to improve your success rates in the end of the procedure. When it comes to the other modality, we know that for ureteroscopy, for percutaneous stone surgery, we do all these procedures by ourselves. We know the tips and tricks to lower the complication rates, to increase the success rates. But when it comes to shock related tripsy, I know majority of the urologists, they don't do the procedure by themselves. They leave the procedure for the technicians and they talk about the data that they don't perform by themselves coming from the, let's say, ability, experience of somebody else. That's not acceptable. So once again, thank you so much. We will know these tips and tricks. We will have the necessary experience. And most importantly, we will perform the procedure by ourselves. And the success rates will go up. Thank you so much once again. And now we will have the other poll question again for the participants, dear participants. So question is here, and we will be waiting for the results coming from the participants. Question is about the three factors to provide excellent chocolate treatment. More than one choices could be, let's say, selected by the participants. Let's see how the our dear participants will reply, or comment, the question. All right, Alberto, we uh -huh. have the data now. How do you comment on the yeah. choices of the participants? Tell us something, please. I think that all the items are important, and to ask about, I think that the correct patient selection, I agree with the audience, is the most important thing to, to, to increase the success rate. The coupling, the coupling is uh, important, very important as well. And uh, the imaging and to ask that the low clear localization monitoring of the stone, I think that is uh, three important aspects. So I agree with the audience. It's difficult sometimes and to ask to, to establish an order, but in this case, I think that and the selection is and to ask so good and I agree and to ask with the audience. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Correct patient selection, coupling to ensure no bubbles, in the therapy head, and also imaging is the most important part that we talked about during shock value to tripsy. Thank you so much, Alberto, for this nice presentation. And when it comes to pa patient selection, it is very important. That means good indications. Good indication means evidence-based data, and it brings us to the guidelines. What do the guidelines tell us about the indications, patient selection, not only for adults, but also for periodic cases? And it's now 
my pleasure to invite my dear friend, Alex. I worked with him for more than eight years in the guidelines panels in EAU, in the urology as part, and it was a pleasure to work with him. He is really very exper experienced in guidelines part. Alex, Alex, please tell us something about the guidelines indications. What's new? Good afternoon. Thank you. So thank you very much, Kemal, for a very nice invitation. I would like to uh, thank Ulyss and to Dornier Company for inviting me to this excellent webinar. So let's start about guidelines. At first, what about the treatment of urinary stones? It's a great change in medicine in the last 40 years, these new methods. But have a look to this old picture of Hieronymus Bosch and we can see here the old ESWL, HM3, and even first ureteroscopies. But speak about the problems. What methods are used in the treatment of urinary stones? The three most common methods are shockwave lithotripsy, an endoscopic method as a ureteroscopy and PNL, but be aware about the invasiveness. That means that shockwave lithotripsy is only the, low, the method with very low invasivity. Conservative treatments excellent in cases especially of ureteric stone and laparoscopy instrumentation and open surgery. It's not commonly used in the treatment of urinary tract stones. The first question, do we need guidelines? And it's necessary to say yes. And why? Because it's evidence-based medicine approved tool for management of the disease and it's essential. So what guidelines are used? And the first most used in Europe are the EAU guidelines and they are based on a work of panel of experts. It's based on the evidence-based medicine and annual search of papers level one or two it's done and they all are evaluated if they fulfill the criteria and when yes they are included to the guidelines some picos were done and i will show you some of them and each recommendation should have a literature evaluation and support it's essential the uh, advantage of the EAU guidelines, they are comprehensive and they are fully covering the topic of diagnostic, therapy, selection of the methods, and especially special cases as pediatric, pregnant, uh, malformation cases done. Yeah. The second guidelines are the American and they are based on a panel of experts. The search was done from 1985 to 2015, 1911 publications were included, and thus 45 recommendation for 15 index patients. It's something quite different from the EAU, but they are excellent too. The third guideline, which I want to mention, are the British NICE guideline, and they have a detailed methodology and the great difference is that the non-medical experts are included. It's excellent description of the evidence in them. And most important, it's an economical point of view of the therapy. It's not included in the European nor American guidelines. So the previous speakers in the speeches, we mentioned the things related to the selection of the patient according to uh, EBM to the border, to the skin to stone density, skin to stone distance to the density. And let's speak about the selection due to the stones and the location, the diameter. The first, renal stones less than three millimeters. EAU guidelines, shockwave lithotripsy, and EAU, it's equal to the retrograde intravenous surgery. British is the first option of all. And it's the great difference for the British. Renal stone less than 10 millimeters, first line indication. And just remember, ESWL plus ureteroscopy 
it's a decreasing stone free rate due to stone size. With increasing stone size, less stone free rate. What about stones between 10 and 20 millimeter? For EAU guidelines are the stones except the lower pole stones. And here, it's first line treatment equal to the retrograde intrarenal surgery. And it's quite interesting. It's the same for all guidelines. The stones more than 20 millimeters, uh, practically first line treatment, it's PNL. When you want to consider just shockwave therapy for these cases, it should be only strictly indicated case with very, for example, low density of the stone. What about the lower pole stone? It's a great problem. And the EAU uh, is saying about the favorable anatomy and non-favorable anatomy. And what's the anatomy factors are? And it's the diameter of the lower calyx distance and the axis between the pelvis and the lower pole. So for EAU, for EAU guidelines, all for the favorable of all the methods are equal. And for non favorable guidelines, ESW, it's said that it's a second like option. But let's have a look to the papers on which the guidelines are used, are based. And when you look to them, only in two papers from six, there was found a value of the unfavorable anatomy of the stone free right after procedure. And when we look about uh, in the results uh, of retrograde intrarenal uh, surgery, the influence of the anatomy of collecting system, when you found the shock uh, unfavorable factors as the steep angle, the results even of the endoscopy are lower than in the rest of the patients. So it's, that this is the uh, conclusion for guidelines for the renal stones. What about over the conclusions for the ureteric stone? At first, we should offer MET, that means uh, medical expulsion therapy in stones and uh, especially in the distal ureteric stones and it's quite different that EAU recommends for stones more than five millimeters and the British and American for distal of ureteric stones less than one centimeter. What about EAU guidelines for the stone? For proximal stone, stone more than one centimeter, shockwave lithotripsy first, but ureteroscopy equal. For less than 10 millimeter, ESWL is the first line treatment. And distal ureteric stone, stone and more 10 millimeters equal, or, or ureteroscopy better. And then uh, for stones less than 10 millimeter in distance, shockwave lithotripsy and ureteroscopy are equal. And quite interesting is this PICO, which was done for the upper ureteric stone by the EAU stone panel, and it was published in European Urology in 2017. And it's a comparison of shockwave lithotripsy and ureteroscopy in upper ureteric stone. And there were included 47 papers from last uh, 15 years. And what the conclusions are, ureteroscopy, it has a high stone free rate in four weeks, but same in the three months. So when you consider the only one advantage of ureteroscopy to ESWL, that you have higher stone free rates in four weeks. In three months, it will be the same. And ureteroscopy has a worse results due to complication of hospital stay, but it's better in retreatment and auxiliary procedures. So it's 
This is the, uh, maybe one of the message. When we compare ESWL and ureteroscopy in the treatment of upper ureteric stone, the results in four months are the same. When you want to have faster stone removal in ureteroscopy has an advantage. And what about NICE? And it's quite very interesting because in all cases in stone less than 10 millimeters should be performed ESWL from the economical point of view. And even it's written there that for all stone less than one centimeters in the ureter and in the kidney, you should offer two sessions of the ESWL before you consider any invasive endoscopical treatment. So what about EAU guidelines in the children? In children, the indication for shockwave lithotripsy, ureteroscopy, and PNL are similar as to the guidelines for adults, but ESWL is more pronounced. And last but not least, the COVID-19 EAU recommendations and with a high priority of removing on the stone, intervention treatment, shockwave lithotripsy or ureteroscopy should be performed. And my take home message is that we have to find the less invasive proper treatment for each stone. Thank you for attention. Thank you, Alice. Thank you for this excellent presentation, stating that shockwave lithotripsy has clear-cut indications, not only for adults, but also for pediatric cases in the guidelines, and we need to take them into account before the selection of the patients. So we will have another poll question now regarding this presentation. This is the question, and we're waiting for the replies coming from the participants. Question is about you have the system, shock value to the system, indication is right, but you will not apply in which conditions? So Alish, results are there. Just one or two sentences, please, because we are running our time. So, okay. I think that the, the main problem is, as I can see, that the people do not have access to ESWL. And it's one of the important things, because be aware, when you perform ESWL in 48 hours after first sign of the renal colic, you will have excellent results. And it's one of the main messages. Sometimes it's said that ureteroscopy is lower, uh, it's ureteroscopy is better in the stone free rate than ESWL. But when you do this immediate ESWL in 48 hours after first appearance of renal colic, you will have excellent results. And it's my take home message. Thank you so much, Alice. Thanks a lot. And now we came to the final presentation for which I'm sure it will be very interesting and very important. The topic is factors really affecting the urologist decision for shock relativity. What are the main parameters, main factors? Professor Gökçe from Ankara, please go on. Thank you once again, Professor Sarıca and good afternoon everybody again. 
Uh, this is really an important topic, as it was it's mentioned uh, from the guidelines also. We have actually certain indications for treatment of the stones, but there's an important gap between these ideal choices and in the real life. We cannot always do what we want or what is written in the book. And uh, this is one of my favorite slides actually for the presentations and because we now have our PSA for stone disease, that's the personalized stone approach. It's really important and our main treatment goal is to establish complete stone clearance with less complications, less hospital stay and less operative times. And in order to do that, we have really very important weapons to treat stones and we, can, we should use them wisely based on some important factors. And now we have another bullet uh, here that is the COVID-19 pandemic. It altered our treatment options, but now we are normalizing, uh, but still we need to take care of this situation as well. Uh, as I mentioned in the previous pre presentation, the popularity of chaperone epilepsy is decreasing and uh, we have decreased interest on that. And when we ask the question why our interest is decreasing, first of all, the, the important point is when we ask our colleagues, the urologists and our residents actually, the main answer is they usually complain about the results are really varying between the centers considerably. That is uh, between the operators and between the centers because there is no standardization for performing the shockwave to DRIPSI process. The other one is we have some important technical improvements for the endourology procedures and therefore we like to operate more with these fancy tools. And another important point is that we usually do not talk about a lot is the reimbursement strategies of the social security systems and the insurance policies. They usually pay less for shockwave photripsy compared to the other endurological procedures and it usually affects our treatment choices as well, although we do not talk about it a lot. And the last but not least important one is the patient expectations. Now, currently most of our patients want to get rid of their stones as soon as possible and get back to their normal life and work as soon as possible and re it really also affects our treatment choices as well during the personalized approach. So in order to uh, close the gap between what is real and what is ideal, uh, first of all we should improve the shock wave to trips outcomes and as mentioned uh, by Dr. Alberto and also the answer to the poll question, proper patient selection is really very important and another one is we need to have a dedicated team to, for shockwave to trip C as well as the neurology procedures, uh, because we all know that the success rate of any procedure improves with increased experience. And also as urologists, we should be the head of this dedicated team and sh we should be the operator for the shockwave to trip C as well. And we should just obey the rules of shockwave to trip C. We should play by the book. And another important point is we should make the patient expectations realistic. They need to know about what are, they, what are they going to face during the treatment and after the treatment? They need to know that they will expel those stones and uh, about the uh, consequences of shockwave to therapy so that we can improve the patient perception of shockwave to therapy very well. And regarding the patient selection, it's all mentioned very well and just not to repeat it, but I advocate for using a non contrast CT evaluation with a low dose CT in order to make our patient selection perfect. First of all, the CT evaluation gives us some important information on the indications to select the appropriate patient, but also even a non-contrast study gives us important clues about the contraindications as well. For example, with a non-contrast study, we can also see an aortic aneurysm or renal artery aneurysm, that's the direct contraindication, and also some skeletal malforma malformations and anatomical, anatomical abnormalities may also be observed then we can select our patients appropriately. Uh, another uh, important point is using these parameters, we can use some scoring systems in order to predict the shockwave to trips outcomes so that we select the patients that will benefit from shockwave. For example, this is this triple D score is a very simple scoring system and it takes into account the stone volume, stone to skin distance, stone density, and just making a simple scoring system, you can predict very well the shockwave to trips outcomes. And in our institution, we also make, made an external validation of this scoring system for the elderly patients in both renal and urethral stones. And I can say that it's really working very well. But the thing we need to point out is every center should have their own kind of values for these parameters. Another important issue is the treatment of impacted urethral stones. And while doing that, we should select our patients very wisely. 
as we all know, for the upper urethral stones, trochoeototrypsy has directly a good place for the treatment indications. But if the stone is impacted, then it's useless to go with shockwave. And in order to predict the outcomes, there is an important parameter that is the urethral wall thickness. And uh, in this paper by the group of Professor Sarija, they outlined urethral wall thickness as an independent predictor for shockwave lutripsy success. And in the later years, uh, other studies also mentioned the outcomes uh, of certain parameters for predicting the stone free rates of shockwave lutripsy. For example, a machine learning algorithm was used in a study in 2018. And also in the last May, another study was published by a Swiss group, taking into account again, Hansfield unit, stone size, skin to stone distance, and the placement of a JJ stand. And with the help of these parameters, it's really uh, possible to predict the outcomes of shock wave to tripsy. Uh, here, examples of two patients we have. First patient has an eight millimeter stone and the Hansfield unit is less than 600, and the stone to six skin distance is less than 10 centimeter, and this patient will probably benefit from shockwave to trypsy very well. However, the second patient has a stone of 16 millimeters, the density is over 1500 Hansfield units, and the skin to stone distance is long, and therefore this patient will be a poor candidate for shockwave to trypsy, so we should select our patients wisely just with working on the non-contrast CT scans very well. The second important uh, thing is to have a dedicated team for, man uh, for management of uh, urinary stones with the shockwave to tripsy. As we all know, outcomes of any surgical procedure in terms of success and complication rates improve with the expertise of the center and the operator. And we should follow the rules, the tips and tricks to perform the shockwave to tripsy. They are very well outlined in the previous presentations. And as the urologist, we should be the operator. We should be next to the uh, device and we should do the operation. As mentioned before, does any of us let our technician or nurse to perform a flexible urethroscopy or pancreas surgery? I'm sure that the answer is no. So why it should be the case for shock to tripsy? And the other important factor that we usually do not talk about a lot is the reimbursement and the insurance systems. It, these are usually against shockwave to tripsy. They are paid less for shockwave. For example, in my country, in Turkey, we know that pancreas surgery is paid 10 times more than a shockwave to tripsy session. And we are limited to perform three sessions in a six month period for the same side of the kidney. And uh, this usually, in, especially in case of multiple stones, limits our use of shockwave to tripsy. But the real problem here is that the reimbursement systems usually pay for the name or the code of the procedure. But this, is, this should actually be changed because this reimbursement should be uh, relying on the success of the procedures, the, that successful treatment of a clinical condition. For instance, we may, we may have a 20 millimeter renal pelvis stone and we should be paid for complete clearance of the stone without any complications and without need for any auxiliary procedures. And I'm sure if we are paid the same for shock wave and flexible urethroscopy, in such a case, we should perform shock wave to therapy more if we are paid equally for the two different procedures. And the last but not the least important part is we should make the patient expectations realistic and meet, meet their needs. And in order to do that, first of all, the patients should have adequate knowledge about their clinical conditions and the possible treatments. This is a very nice study published by the group of Cleveland Clinic years ago, and they just gave their patients, patients a hypothetical case of eight millimeter lower pole stone. And they wanted the patients to opt for surveillance, shockwave or flexible urethroscopy with the given success rates. And interestingly, 45% of the patients shows shockwave to tripsy over flexible urethroscopy and surveillance. But the most important result from the study was 85% of the patients stated that they just rely on their physician's recommendation. So it's, it should be emphasized that we should, uh, we should just educate our patients very well. And for this reason, with our group, we actually developed a decision aid that's a written tool with a booklet in order to inform the patients about the outcomes of shockwave to tripsy and flexible urethroscopy for a non-lower pole stone less than 20 millimeter in diameter. And we evaluated this tool in a prospective randomized study and find out that there's significant improvement in the level of 
the knowledge of the patients and also significant decrease in their decisional conflict scales. And not published, but there was an interesting data as well. Uh, two thirds of the patients in the study actually chose uh, shock wave to tripsy over flexible ureteroscopy. So in conclusion, in order to close the gap between the ideal and the reality, first of all, we should optimize the outcomes of shock wave to tripsy. And in order to do that, First rule is to appropriately select our patients. The second one, we should be the operator. We should be head of the team. We should be there while, that, while the patient is undergoing shockwave to tripsy treatment. And we should follow the tips and tricks to do it appropriately. And in, all, all, in the national and international levels, the reimbursement system should be revised to pay for a successful treatment of a clinical condition, not the name or code of the procedure. And also we should very well inform our patients, make, it, make them have uh, realistic expectations. And also at the end with the personalized treatment option, we, can, we, we should just uh, make them uh, all of their expectations met and successful treatment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ilker. Thanks a lot for this really excellent presentation that I really listened to for the first time, focusing on the parameters that are very important for the urologist not to consider shock irritability sometimes as the preferred one, even if they know it should be, but they don't uh, choose it as the appropriate treatment modality due to the certain factors that you stated. So now we will have some questions from the participants, if there is any, to reply in okay. the end of, um. please. Okay. Please. Hi, hi everyone. It's your thank turn you, Dr. now. <laughs> no, thank you Please. all for, for really great uh, presentations. Um, as we, we have run out of, of time, um, and it's also great participations from the audience, um, I'll, I'll highlight one key question maybe because about four or five uh, questions have been raised about the training. So I think a lot of the audience have recognized the importance of the operator and that sometimes the physicians are not doing the uh, treatment. So one key question is how can we encourage young urologists to perform um, shockwave lithotripsy procedures by themselves? Um, so that's, that's one question to start. Alice, are you going to tell something? Then I will, I will add some comments. Yeah, I will, I will. So it's a great problem because all young urologists, they want to operate. They want to become urologists, that means operating. And ESWL is sometimes maybe boring for them. So I think uh, the first encourage is that it should be a part of the curriculum of the urologist. It's not very good for them, but it's essential. And of course, money, I think, is the best way uh, how to motivate the young urologist, probably. Thank you so much, Alice. You are right. We should teach the young generation also on the shock irritability treatment and its principles. We know in some departments they don't have the system, but in the other departments, even if they have the system, they leave the treatment to the technician. And even sometimes in residents, they don't see the system itself. The uh, faculties, or stuff in the department don't mention about the system to the resident. That's not the case. You are right. It should be a one part of the stone treatment. Okay, so I think um, that's great. I think even the audience has suggested some training courses in international meetings that they are requesting. Um, along these lines, um, who do you think then for some countries, I think they don't have training who should help to train urologists in such situation, uh, in your opinion, where they don't no longer have uh, training for, for SWL in their curriculum? May I answer? So yeah. in Czech Republic, it's uh, uh, the ESWL, it's a part of the curriculum. But I think that essential is to have some workshops and uh, some speeches, uh, lectures, how to use the system, because there are some topics, how to target stone using all of the ultrasound. 
and it's it's essential it's essential and i think that it's a good idea from the audience that uh, some hands-on try courses should be done on the urological events so i think it will be good and it's a good topic for future okay so maybe we just spend one minute. There's a, there were a couple of questions on whether you might have some tips and tricks to share with them on the ultrasound-based localization and another separate uh, question on localization of stones in the mid ureter. If there's only a yeah, quick uh, tip for them. Yeah, for ultrasound localization, it's, it's, it's difficult really sometimes. So you need uh, a deep uh, training and don't skip for that. I think that uh, the ultrasonic uh, localization is uh, preferable, is, is the best option and to ask for the patient. And it's very easy in the kidney, but in the mid ureter, it's very difficult to localize with sonography localization. So in these cases, and to ask you have to, to use uh, X-ray localization, it's not possible to that. You have some problems, you can use a, a contrast medium and to ask to, to localize the, the stone in the, in the mid ureter. But sonography is very useful. It's very useful in the kidney, but in the ureter, it's very difficult to, to localize in the stones. I fully agree. The exception are only the stones uh, in the pyloureteric and vesicoureteric junction. In the distal ureter, in the vesicoureteral junction, it's quite nice to target the stone by ultrasonography. Yes, of course. Mm. Wonderful. Okay, so maybe we, we can have one last question while uh, Dr. Kamal um, tries to get back on. How, how do you think, so there's an important topic you raised about being in reimbursed lower for SWL and if it were more equalized, you would make choices based on more the, the value and the outcome uh, rather than the, the amount of uh, reimbursement. So is there any way uh, from this panel you have ideas on how we might be able to improve uh, reimbursement or, or equalize it based on the value uh, treatment offered to the patient? I'd be keen to hear your thoughts. Yeah. So I'm a member of the board of Czech Urological Association. I, I'm, I'm, I'm involved in this economic problems and it's a really great problem. You have to have a very good economic analysis and then start to negotiate with the insurance company to ask the patients and politicians for support. But even in this time, we will be, and we are still paid now by the uh, diagnosis related groups. And I'm afraid that in the next year, probably, we will get less money for the treatments, both for uh, ESWL and ureteroscopy, but the government will increase the cover for oncological treatment in urology and so on. So it's a great problem and uh, you have to find some mixture of the cases, not only stone, but the rest of the disease in your department, probably. But it's a great problem. Okay, um, we, we are coming to the end. I think one, maybe we try and see whether uh, Kamal might be able to come back on. Um, is the CT scan necessary in your opinion for all ESWL treatments or only for certain stone sizes or locations you, you prefer or do you use it for everything? I think that uh, CT scan uh, gives us uh, a lot of information. It's not only the localization of the stone, it's the, the size of the stone. We can calculate the area of the stone. And of course, uh, the Hansfield unit is the hardness in terms of the stone. So I think that if you don't know the composition of the stone, because it's the first time that you are going to treat a patient, in these cases, I think that it's, uh, it's an important uh, important diagnostic test and to get to decide uh, the best option for the patient. Very important thing is the radiation. And now it's necessary to know that we have the options of the low dose and ultra low dose CT. And it can decrease the radiation dose for the CT scans extremely to approximately one and a half QB. So I think from this point of view, it's acceptable because it has the same 
sensitivity and specificity for the stones more than four millimeters in patients with body mass index less than 30 and it will give you excellent information to choose the proper treatment for the patient. Okay, uh, thank you all very much. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Dr. Sarika has uh, some internet problems, so he's not finding, able to, to close uh, with the closing remarks. I think um, thank you to all the panelists um, for, for your time and your valuable sharings. I think there's been a lot of questions with, with interest in even more depth in uh, the tips and tricks and the, the, the valuable um, highlights for this technique to improve the skills and improve the stone free rate. Um, very key sort of issues have been raised in terms of favorability in outcomes, largely due to operator and also differences in the technology and not a one size fits all uh, procedure. And we, we look forward to the chance to perhaps uh, dive deeper into some of these topics um, we encourage the, the audience, thank you all for staying till the end. We have had about 130 to 140 participants uh, listening intently throughout. Um, so please um, help us fill up the post-webinar survey that will come up right after uh, you leave the presentation. And we take your feedback and hope to see you again the next time. Thank you to all our panelists and our audience. Thank you very much. Thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.